I just want to welcome you. It's my privilege to welcome you to, this is our fifth Kathy Cook Lecture in Women's Mental Health. And um, it's also really nice we're doing this in March. It's usually we do this in April, but it's very timely because March is um, Women's History Month, and yesterday was International Women's Day, so even more a great time to be celebrating women's mental health and the Kathy Cook Endowed Lecture. As you know, the lecture is funded through an endowment from memorial gifts made to the hospital in memory of Kathy, who was the former vice president and chief development officer at McLean. And it was Kathy's wish that any gifts in her honor be directed to support women's mental health at McLean. As many of you know, she was a beloved member of our community for 17 years, retired in 2016, and passed away in June of 2017. In 1999, Kathy came to work for McLean as the director of development. The department consisted of only two people, and Kathy was one of them. During her time at McLean, she grew the department from two to 15, and through her tireless work, clear vision, and unyielding commitment, she transformed McLean's fundraising efforts and increased our annual philanthropy by almost 400% during her time. She was a perpetually upbeat person with a warm personality, and I think all of you who knew her know what I'm talking about, and had an absolute dedication to McLean's mission. It enables her to build trusting and long-term relationships with donors and potential donors, and during her tenure at the helm, the department raised more than $223 million for the hospital. Kathy's natural leadership ability, her exuberance for her work, coupled with a really true com passion for and interest in other people and an un uncompromising commitment to excellence just made her a wonderful mentor for new staff and a tremendous colleague. Kathy showed early on a passion for the area of women's mental health and was one of the early supporters and champions of developing a division of women's mental health at McLean and expanding that vision. I'm actually personally very grateful to Kathy. She was extremely supportive of me, both professionally and personally. I actually think of her very, very often. This lecture is particularly significant because one of the last initiatives that Kathy helped to launch was the Women's Mental Health Leadership Council, a group that was grow, has grown now to more than 120 women in the community who support women's mental health treatment, both at McLean, but also around the globe. Kathy continues to be missed, but we're absolutely thrilled each year to honor her with this lecture today. So with that, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Grace Chang as today's Kathy Cook Women's Mental Health Endowed Lecturer. Dr. Grace Chang is professor and head of Harvard Psychiatry at the VA Boston Healthcare System. In addition, she is the chair of the Harvard Medical School Psychiatry Executive Committee. She is the first woman and Asian American to serve in this capacity in the committee's history. She's also the current president of the Massachusetts Psychiatric Society. A graduate of Yale College and Rutgers Medical School, Dr. Chang completed her training in general adult psychiatry at the Yale University School of Medicine, where she was subsequently a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar in internal medicine and psychiatry. I've known Dr. Chang since we were both early um, early career psychiatrists, so it's, come, it's now a, a, quite a long time. So, she has had a long-standing interest in women and, and substance use disorders. She conducted the first large randomized trial of a brief intervention for alcohol use in pregnancy, which was followed by other studies about women and alcohol. She's truly the national go-to expert on interventions with pregnant women who are using alcohol during their pregnancy. Her contributions to the prevention of fetal alcohol syndrome was recognized by the National Organization of Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, NOFAS, which named her to the Tom and Linda Daschle Hall of Fame in 2011 and the 2013 Distinguished Alumnus Award from the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Her recent clinical responsibilities have included serving as Medical Director of the Inpatient Addictions Unit and Director of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry VA Boston Healthcare. And with that, really please welcome Dr. Grace Chang. Thanks so much. Well, thank you all so much for this singular honor of presenting, and I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you. Whoops. I'm going to talk about prenatal alcohol, alcohol exposure and to summarize the past decade of research. And um, these are my disclosures, and I want to thank the VA librarian for her help. We're going to go through the critical background. I will present the past decade of research, summarizing it, and highlighting the next steps, because I'm counting on all of you to make, to make the final push. 
critical background? Well, let's just say prenatal alcohol exposure is common, very consequential, and we have some recommendations from professional groups. It's actually the legal substances that are most problematic in terms of effect and magnitude in the antepartum. Nearly 14% of pregnant women drank in the past 30 days. One out of 20 was binge drinking. And this 30-day estimate is very likely to be low. How many people do you know overreport their drinking? With regards to cigarettes and e-cigarettes, about 20% of, of women smoked or used them in the 30 days before pregnancy. About 10% are using during pregnancy. And most concerningly, um, cannabis, now that it's legal, uh, is very common. 7%, it's going up every year, and people think of it as a natural remedy, um, and I think we're gonna learn something very different. Amongst the people who use a quarter smoke daily, um, and prescription opiates are uh, clocking in at 3% of pregnancies. As I mentioned, past month use of alcohol is an underestimate. There is a national birth defects prevention study in 2009 that looked at 4,100 randomly selected control women who delivered live-born infants without birth defects. And in this group, 30% drank. Um, and nearly 10% had binge drinking, defined as four or more drinks per episode while pregnant. This is an underestimate because notice how this study, ex by definition, excluded those babies who had defects, fetal birth defects, um, the women who had spontaneous abortion. These are all effects from prenatal alcohol exposure. So this is an underestimate. This study did give us some idea as to who does drink during pregnancy, non-Hispanic white women, women who also smoke cigarettes. In fact, use increases with age, education, and income. Um, unintended pregnancy, keep in mind that in the U.S. 50% of all pregnancies are unplanned. And the best predictor of prenatal alcohol use is pre-pregnancy drinking. And I myself have sliced and diced the data. It's really what they drank before. And half will drink before pregnancy. And I'd like to point out, you know, this kind of, you know, I think that sometimes there's this picture of someone who drinks during pregnancy, and it's usually an uneducated, probably minority person. Not, not true. This, the profile suggests this is a group of women who drink regularly. It's a lifestyle issue. They know when to have Chablis, when to have Chardonnay. It's a totally different picture. Most recent data from the National Survey on Drug Use in Households, 2015 to 2018, found that at least 10% of pregnant women had an alcoholic drink in the past 30 days. But please also note, nearly half also used other substances, most often tobacco and marijuana. So it's, um, it's, it's an interesting combination. Of all the substances, alcohol is the only one that is a known teratogen. It is the sole necessary cause for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, and it is now estimated that one out of 20 school kids has some evidence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, one out of 20, and um, it's a lifelong issue. There's a range of effects, and it's so tricky because it's a range. We have the most severe end, abnormal facial features, small head size, low body weight, poor coordination, but there are all these other subtle effects, like hyperactive behavior. Again, these persist for a lifetime. The only thing that works is early intervention, but I think this need for early intervention widens the gap between the haves and the have-nots, because certain people will latch on to it immediately and others will not. So this is the classic picture of the child with fetal alcohol syndrome with the classic abnormal facies. The child will have growth problems and will have CNS problems like learning, memory, attention span, communication. 
There's something also called alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, and it's primarily manifest as intellectual disabilities, problems with behavior and learning. So these are the issues that don't show up until the kid is in school. So again, I think it's an underestimate of what's going on. So the kid is in school and has trouble with math or has poor impulse control has impaired judgment. So these are all other examples of potential fetal alcohol effects. Just making a point, alcohol-related birth defects don't have to be visible. There can be problems with vision, hearing, development of the heart, kidneys, and bones. And again, not something you might think of immediately. So I'm happy to tell you about this very exciting study, the ABCD study. It's the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. And this is exactly the type of study we need to be doing now. This involves 21 research sites, nearly 12,000 adolescents, and it is studying the adolescent brain. What's an early outcome? Any prenatal alcohol use is associated with subtle yet significant psychological and behavioral effects in children, greater psychopathology, attention deficits, impulsiveness. There's a change in how the brain is formed. And one of my favorite colleagues at the VA calls alcohol a brain solvent. I think he's right. Greater cerebral and regional volume and greater regional surface area, so that's a difference. Uh, resting state functional connectivity was largely unaltered. And some of the outcomes at baseline in one year were partially explained by brain differences in brain structure. Most prudent advice, women should continue to be advised to abstain from alcohol consumption from conception throughout pregnancy. There's no safe time, there's no safe amount, and there's no safe alcohol, no, what, no matter what our patients tell us. You know what, beer actually is not safer, okay? So to summarize, prenatal alcohol exposure is harmful. It's linked to miscarriage, stillbirth, preterm birth, sudden infant death syndrome. It is the sole necessary cause of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. If you don't drink, you're not at risk. It is the leading preventable cause of disability. What's so tricky about FASD is that it also reflects lifestyle, social, genetic, gestational factors. So it's hard to pinpoint. And we do believe that specific maternal drinking behaviors linked to FASD are not entirely known. And therefore, we still need to work hard on this area. Um, we need to reduce the incidence of FASD. The Healthy People goals for 2030 is to reduce prenatal alcohol exposure to 92%. I'd say we're pretty far away. It's a stretch goal. So one of your previous uh, Kathy Cook uh, lecturers, Dr. Jones, talked about the World Health Organization guidelines for the identification and management of substance use and substance use disorders in pregnancy. These came out in 2014. The purpose was to enable professionals uh, to assist pregnant women to optimize outcomes. And there were levels of review, the WHO internal steering group, the guideline development group, Dr. Jones was part of that, the external review group. I, I think I was part of the external re review group. And I have to say, that was going to, to the World Health Organization in Geneva was one of the most exciting things. Um, it was hard work, though. Um, the organization decided to apply the GRADE system to assess the quality of evidence. And it's GRADE is an acronym for grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluations. And it was desired to have a transparent framework. Now, all the efforts to be objective notwithstanding, it should be noted that GRADE is subjective. Evidence was rated on four different levels, uh, very low, low, moderate, and high. What did they find? So 
Amongst the psychosocial recommendations, examples being motivational interviewing and home visits after delivery, there was actually very little evidence to support their use. And the organization offered only a conditional recommendation. Screening and brief intervention was given a strong recommendation. They felt that the quality of evidence was low. I tried not to take it personally. Um, but much of the data predates the grade standards. So how we did research also changed in the time. What do the professional organizations say? The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists issued a committee of opinion in 2015, creating an ethical framework for doctors. They encouraged routine screening methods, brief interventions, and referral to treatment. Similarly, in 2020, the Society of OBGYNs in Canada recommended that all pregnant women should be asked about alcohol use with evidence-based screening and brief intervention approaches. Clinical implications for us, the United States Preventive Services Task Force issued um, a grade B, not an A, but a B recommendation in 2018. All adults, 18 or older, should, including pregnant women, should be screened for unhealthy alcohol use. And that should provide brief <laughs> behavioral counseling interventions to reduce it. The benefits so outweigh the risks. There are small, there are very limited harms, non-invasive screening, the brief intervention. And made a recommendation from a public health perspective that integrated evidence-based interventions to prevent alcohol-related harms and address factors associated with alcohol consumption should be implemented. So I'd like to review the past decade of research and how this was accomplished was uh, literature search beginning in 2011. It was um, professionally done pulling the articles. Search terms included alcohol drinking and pregnancy. Uh, 238 records were returned. 217 were eliminated. Um, 21 studies were reviewed. And there were four overarching approaches. So the first major category was studies of case management. And case management always has so much um, appeal. Um, and people, people love it, right? It, it sounds good. Well, what is it? It's a dynamic process that uh, assesses plans, um, implements, coordinates, monitors, and evaluates to improve outcomes. It's a professional care manager who helps patients navigate complicated systems to achieve mutual goals. Um, and it's something that people like. So a whole s a number of article uh, studies were undertaken to look at case management for PAE. So interventions to reduce it, lar largely home visits or case management. Most relied on motivational interviewing and community reinforcement. So there were two unblinded indicated profession efforts that took place in South Africa. The first was done by Dr. Phil May in 2013, and it was case management offered to 41 women who had a child with FASD, drank a lot in a prior pregnancy or currently drinking, offered case management with interviews at baseline and follow-up. There was 27 percent loss to attrition and found that the women drank less at six months, but these gains did not persist. And it was felt that making enduring change is difficult in this social setting. This is a group of women that actually did not have access to running water. Um, and the investigators argued that it was unethical to do a randomized trial. Dr. DeVries similarly based her work on uh, Dr. May's study, also took place in the Western Cape province of South Africa. 67 women, 24% lost to follow-up. Very similar findings. Uh, there was a decrease in alcohol use at six months, but there was an increase at 12 and 18 months. There were two great randomized trials. Um, 
particularly the one that took place in Canada. Let me start with the Rother and Boris study that was done in 2019, also in, in South Africa, a longitudinal cluster randomized design amongst 1,236 mothers and their children and um, standard care versus the intervention. The intervention was called the Filani program that included home visiting, um, and they provided an intervention on prenatal alcohol use. They followed these women for five years. That's like amazing, right? What they found though, that was drinking actually increased over five years, and it didn't have very much of an effect. So the next study was done by Catherine et al. in, in Canada, and this was a really ambitious study. Public health nurses provided frequent one-to-one -one home visits from early pregnancy to age two to identify health and social goals and to reduce prenatal substance use. 739 pregnant women had an average, now check this out, 14 prenatal visits and 50 postpartum visits. Like That was really a lot of effort. What they found was that there was no evidence that the nurse family practitioner was effective in reducing either prenatal alcohol or cigarette use. So the case management approach, despite its appeal, doesn't appear to have strong empirical support. And this is consistent with the World Health Organization uh, guidelines and assessment. The next ba major category was preconception trials to prevent alcohol-exposed pregnancies. These are five studies based on the project choices paradigm. So what is the project choices paradigm? This is something that was created by Ruth Louise Floyd at the CDC in 2006. And what it does or is to target effective contraception and reduction of alcohol use in women of childbearing age who were drinking to excess, who were sexually active, and used motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral strategies. So this is like a really tight package. It's a really tight approach. So there were five studies that were done in the past decade. The first was done in South Africa by Christy mandel Mikosi, 165 women, the classic paradigm. And what she found was that medical doctors have, are more successful or somehow more influential. Ingersoll in 2013, 217 community women in Texas, single session, not as effective. Hansen et al., 193 non-pregnant American Indian women who were offered a tailored Ogala Sioux tribe intervention versus in, er, information only found that there was in fact reduced risk of alcohol exposed pregnancy, but the way it worked was to improve contraception, not to reduce drinking. So Bell et al. in Florida, 354 women at risk for an alcohol exposed pregnancy, uh, given a project choices style in MI or information only, there was no difference at six months um, and again, the risk reduction occurred primarily through better contraception, not through reduced drinking. Last study, Velasquez et al., 261 non-pregnant, sexually active, risk-drinking women of childbearing age, randomized to the choices or something else, um, and attention to treat analysis at nine months. And again, it reduced the risk of alcohol exposed and tobacco exposed pregnancies, but again, through improved contraception. So these studies are very similar. Um, the population, women at risk, childbearing age, not using contraception, drink at risky levels, you know, beautifully done. There's this package, they do everything perfectly. The findings are similar. Contraception is improved, but alcohol use is not impacted. So the question that I have is what happens when these women become pregnant by choice? So this, this addresses part of the problem, but what about what happens when they become pregnant? 
The third major category is the effectiveness of motivational enhancement based on SI. So this is like adding, it may be considered gilding the lily. So what can you do to make SBI even more effective? So screening and brief intervention, you screen and assess, you do a brief intervention, you refer to treatment. Um, and this was something that was much more uh, studied um, in between 20, 2000, 2010. Um, and so again, this is a way to see, can we just make it better? So there were two small randomized trials to evaluate the effectiveness of a single session MI to reduce alcohol use during pregnancy. So motivational interviewing has a very set script. It has a set approach. The women were randomized to motivational interviewing or treatment as usual. The first study was 60, had 67 pregnant women. Second study, 122, same group of investigators, Dr. Osterman. And what they found was that there was no difference in any of the groups. So MI didn't actually add a lot. Now they feel that the low level, the baseline drinking levels were quite low to begin with so that there was little room for improvement. But you know, there's no, since there's no safe drinking limit during pregnancy, then maybe some improvement is still desirable. And they, and they found something that has been reported by a number of other investigators that a comprehensive assessment actually may exert an incredibly therapeutic effect. Right, like if you spend several hours going over every drink that someone has had in the past month, past two weeks or whatever, I think people kind of get the message and I think that um, assessment, which seems more objective, can actually be very powerful. So this is um, the last major group of studies and I think it's, this is maybe where the future is. Maybe this is where the action's gonna be. So four different major approaches, text messages, telephone-based interventions, computer-based interventions, and 4D ultrasound. So I'm gonna ask you, which ones do you think might be the most effective? How many people think text, text messages? So a few people. How about telephone-based? A few people. Computer-based? Okay, and ultrasound. So these are, these are all kind of like, this is where, I think this is where we need to look. Okay, so text messages. So text for baby is a social co cognitive theory based mobile health program delivering health messages to pregnant women and new mothers. There are two, two pilot studies, 123 women with low incomes and 943 military um, women. Now that's, that's some pilot study with 943 people, but anyway, seeking prenatal care by the same investigator, Dr. Evans in 2012 and 2014. Baseline evaluations, they were randomized to text for baby and usual care or usual care and follow-up. And there was, a, there was a difference. Now, what he found amongst the pregnant women with lower incomes, there were improvements in attitude toward alcohol consumption and stronger attitudes against alcohol use. Did not work at all for the 943 military women. And, um, I don't know that any other studies have been pursued, but I could see why the 943 uh, study might have been a little discouraging. But maybe, maybe there is something here. Telephone-based interventions. There were two that were done of a preconception intervention for sexually active women of childbearing age who drank and did not use effective contraception. So this is a variation on the project choices, but it's done by phone. So there's something called early remote, 46 women, non-treatment seeking women, one session, remote delivered MI based alcohol exposed pregnancy intervention with follow up, no comparison group. Um, it was found that there were reductions in drinks per day and reductions in unreliable con contraception. So this is truly a pilot study. Randomized trial of 132 women, Brief two session interview via telephone or in person after completing a baseline interview. 
At six month follow up, there were no differences between the groups and there were small reductions in alcohol. So this is a project choices legacy, right? So uh, no reduction in alcohol, improved contraception, and it ha it's true even if you do it by telephone. So computer-based intervention. So, that, so now we're getting warmer, right? Five studies have been trialed. So the biggest one was a randomized cluster trial of 60 Dutch mif midwifery practices, and we'll, I'll say more about that. So I'm going to just summarize the smaller studies. There was a pilot study of 48 women who screened positive for alcohol risk, randomized to a computer-delivered SBI or control session on nutrition. Um, and so it was found to be effective. The women liked the computer brief, computerized uh, brief intervention. The next study I will say more about because it is a cu culturally targeted online expert um, for American Indian and American Native women. A smaller study of 71 risk drinking women at risk without effective contraception were randomized to either an interactive tailored intervention or static untailored patient education website, which I think sounds deadly, right? So I think that the um, interactive one was somewhat more effective. And there was a randomized trial of 50 pregnant women to either computer delivered single session with a booster or treatment as usual. And so it was well received. It has some effects, but it's a small study. So let's look at this big Dutch study. It's kind of exciting because what happened was it was the practices that were randomized, not the women, right? So they were randomized to one of three conditions, health counseling, very prescriptive, seven steps and three feedback sessions, computer tailored feedback, item-based and iterative feedback via the internet. So what does that mean? So the women filled out questionnaires about their alcohol use, they were given feedback, and they were actually given or sent tailored letters about their drinking, encouraging them to cut down and educating them, and usual care. There was follow-up at three months and six months. So what did they find? Well, health counseling wasn't that effective. So we don't know how well it was done, you know, et cetera, et cetera, but it didn't seem to work. Actually, the most promising signal was from the computer-tailored um, intervention where the respondents stopped using alcohol more frequently compared to the uh, usual care people. And that was 78% versus 55%. So it was particularly effective in women with average or lower alcohol use before pregnancy and women with average or lower social support. So this, this is potentially very promising. And what's neat is that it randomized the practices and not the women. Um, so that maybe. This is um, a study that I'm mentioning because it was culturally targeted. It was a culturally targeted screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment for American Indian and Alaska Native women in Southern California. Um, 263 women of childbearing age, about 10% were pregnant, and they too got an assessment, like one of those comprehensive assessments that asks you about everything and maybe dropping a few hints and other things along the way. The women were randomized to either treatment as usual or a web-based intervention. Now, treatment as usual is access to educational brochures about health and waiting rooms and no FASD intervention. And the web-based intervention was called eCheckup to go and it was a web-based assessment and intervention. So what did they find? Both groups reduced risky drinking and vulnerability to alcohol-exposed pregnancies. And again, assessment alone may be sufficient for self-reported behavioral changes. So, you know, I think we should encourage assessments. This is something that I think is really nifty. I mean, because it's just so different. It's so creative. A full 4D ultrasound. So the thought was, if the pregnant women could only visualize their babies, would it change their behavior? Would it change their level of attachment? And uh, this took place in Finland. 
And it was a randomized trial of 90 pregnant women who were getting obstetric care. They were determined to be at high risk for having an alcohol-exposed pregnancy. And they were um, asked to participate in 4D ultrasound visualization of the fetus at 24, 30, and 36 weeks, or treatment as usual. Now, the outcomes, there were similar rates of fetal drug exposure and perinatal outcomes in the group, but the women attending the 4D ultrasound was so much higher, the adherence was like statistically significantly different. You know, something like 80% versus 50%, because I think they really enjoyed or valued or thought that this was something different. So if I were to summarize technology, it appears that text messages and telephone-based interventions may be not so effective or maybe they need to be done differently. Um, Computer-based interventions seem to be promising and maybe we should really start thinking about and looking at novel approaches. Just throwing out that project choices paradigm, I mean no disrespect, but just to do something really different. You know, we're, we're nearly, we're, we've gone through the pandemic, we're going through it. So virtual interventions, maybe that's the way to go. Um, there is going to be a big study that will be launched from Columbia shortly that will take, that will do virtual treatment. I'm looking forward to the results. And then we need to do larger studies of the most promising approaches. So what are the next steps for us? Well, just to summarize, case management and home visits may help some individuals. The empirical support is weak. Preconception approaches exert their effect by improving contraception. And we still don't, I still don't know what it does when the women get pregnant. Maybe we should do a follow-up. Maybe we should see what happens. I don't know if we can do that. Motivational interviewing. So we don't know what the longer-term impact of MIs is, is unclear. I mean, it's an intervention, it's not a miracle, but SBIRT is still the one pr approach that is recommended. And the technological approaches, I think, are promising and need more study. So evidence-based approaches to reduce prenatal alcohol exposure and the incidence of FASD are pending, and some are promising. But I think we need a different approach. We have to have a multi-pronged approach FASD is a complex developmental disability that's determined by a range of lifestyle, sociodemographic, maternal, social, gestational, and genetic factors. Now, many of the studies, by necessity, had a very narrow focus, but really didn't include the complexity of current childbearing issues. Um, now, I think the demand for evidence-based approaches may have some unintended consequences. So when people say no safe drinking limit, you know, some people interpret that to mean that you can drink during pregnancy. Um, wrongo, but anyway, that's true. There are also powerful secular trends that I think we need to think about. There has been markedly increased alcohol consumption among women during and since the COVID-19 pandemic. And so now women are reaching almost true parity with men in terms of alcohol use and exposure, in spite of it being much more negative uh, in terms of health. I think that there has been an exacerbation of mistrust of science and professional advice and their historical roots. And now we, you, know, you can look at anything you want on the internet and you will find something that will support your opinion. And punitive laws on alcohol and substance use by pregnant women. So this is um, the hypothesized pathways to FASD. So the point is very complicated, right? This is like so complicated, but what's the simplest solution? Like don't drink, right? Just don't drink and you can throw away those pathways. This is something I want to highlight because this is not that well known. I think there's a major barrier now, and that is the criminalization of prenatal substance use. And someone always comes up to me after I talk about this and says, oh, I didn't know that this is true. 
It's true. So, Tennessee was the first state to explicitly criminalize prenatal substance use if the child is harmed. 17 states consider prenatal drug use to be child abuse, and three states mandate civil commitment. 15 states mandate healthcare providers to report su suspected abuse, and four states require testing. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is a mandated reporter state just as an FYI. So this is the single best study that has been done. What is the association between state policies and neonatal abstinence syndrome? So this is not a FAS. Neonatal abstinence syndrome, you, you know about it at birth. This is what happens when babies are exposed prenatally to opioids and may manifest signs and symptoms of withdrawal. Right now, there is a baby born with NAS every 15 minutes in the United States. I did the math before coming this morning. That's 1,440 babies a day. I think that's a lot. Anyway, this study looked at, and this is the only study. This is going to be like the landmark study. 4.5 million births in eight states between 2003 and 2014. And the main outcome measure was the rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome. Presumably, these laws are designed to reduce prenatal exposure to drugs. What did they find? States that criminalize substance use in pregnancy, that is, grounds for civil commitment, child abuse or neglect, actually had higher rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome in the first year after enactment. States that require reporting of suspected prenatal substance use did not have higher rates. So that was good. But neither approach resulted in reduced rates. So they didn't, these laws didn't work. Again, unintended consequences. Well, incarceration has been ineffective in reducing the incidence of drug or alcohol abuse during pregnancy. What happens is that the therapeutic relationship is jeopardized. Prenatal care is avoided. Substance dependence is treated as a moral and now a legal failing. And I think this could have disproportionate effects on some women, minority women, poor women, etc. And ACOG has recommended the retraction of the punitive laws and to build an evidence based treatment approach. So I think this has had a chilling effect on the field and on the care of our patients. So frequently people ask me, well, what should we do? So I think that good enough is better than doing nothing. I think we should assess alcohol use. And again, I don't think we should obsess over the amounts that women are drinking. No one ever overreports. If someone says I've had a drink, that's fine. That's all I need to know. I do not need to know the exact number. The fact that she said yes to anything is good enough. We have to make it possible to create alternatives for the women, teach them, help them figure out other ways, educate them that alcohol use during any trimester is problematic, and really have a clear recommendation to abstain. We, of all specialties, should be able to be supportive without being judgmental, and I think we do a good job. I'd like to point out we don't criminalize or punish women with other health conditions that can affect pregnancy or their children. It's not illegal to be a diabetic or to be obese or any of these other things. So why are we doing this about prenatal drug and alcohol use? And then we refer women to more intensive treatment if needed. So this slide summarizes ESPERT, you know, we should all screen patients using a screener. We can recommend that you know women drink less, even abstain during pregnancy. We refer for additional services. We help them develop um, alternatives to identify when they might be at risk for drinking, and we follow up as needed. This is not really hard. We don't need to use motivational interviewing. I think even education is very effective. I'm not sure if you're up for an historical example, but why not?
So this is from Majesty Magazine, which, is some of, which as some of you may know, is the Quality Royal Monthly. And this, I know this caught my eye because this was about Prince Eric and the pandemic. And this refers to the Spanish flu pandemic. Okay, so Prince Eric's life was not an easy one. He was the third son of the then Crown Prince Gustav and Crown Princess Victoria. He was born on April 20th, 1889, the same day as Adolf Hitler. And it soon became clear that the prince was not like other children. The year 1888 had been a difficult one for Crown Princess Victoria, who had mourned several deaths in her family, among them her grandfather, um, the German Emperor Wilhelm I, and her beloved younger brother, Prince Ludwig of Baden. The grief stricken pregnant crown princess frequently felt ill and weak. And in our eyes, I think she was depressed, right? The doctors recommended that she take small amounts of cocaine five, days, five times a day as a remedy, um, that she was also treated with caffeine, cognac, and morphine. And the baby she gave birth to suffered from epilepsy and had learning difficulties. And he died in the Spanish flu pandemic at the age of 17. So I would love it for history not to repeat itself and is the past prologue. So thank you very much. And if there are any questions um, or discussion, that would be great. Thank you. If people have questions, if you can wait for me to get to you with a microphone. Oh, great. Hey, that was great. And, and, and I think extremely important. Um, Thank you, Dr. Kwa. Uh, from a neuroscience perspective, there's, I, I think there's a bit of a false equivalency between narcotic abstinence syndrome and fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, uh, cocaine and opiates act through neurotransmitters that are modulatory and, and much less critical for the normal development of the nervous system, whereas alcohol blocks the NMDA receptor, glutamate receptor, which is critical for neuronal survival, yes. neuronal uh, differentiation, and neuronal connectivity. And that is particularly important in the first 28 weeks, which kind of reminded me of one, one other point that you raised, and that was the uh, sonograms. It's actually a technique used by the anti-abortion uh, um, groups um, because it encourages mother bonding with the fetus, which makes things much more real. My only problem with that is it started at 28 weeks, and that's uh, about um, probably 14 weeks after the, the horses are out of the barn. So it'd be very interesting to see if you could move it up mm -hmm. um, in terms of the uh, exposure to see if uh, the intervention works earlier in development. Well, I think those are excellent points. I think that the study, though, that attempted to, to link the consequences of criminalization, neonatal abstinence syndrome, wasn't saying it was the same as, you know, fetal alcohol exposure, but neonatal abstinence syndrome is something that you can observe directly at birth. Oh, no. Right, right. So just, just to be clear, I think that's, that's going to be the best we're going to have. The point I wanted to make alcohol is a true teratogen a when it comes to brain development, whereas the other two, you know, cocaine and opiates are, 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 are less critical in those processes. Absolutely. Dr. Weiss. Thank you, Grace. Very, very helpful. I have two questions. The first one, what do you know about um, prenatal cannabis exposure? Um, the second one, particularly since you were part of this uh, WHO group, different countries have different attitudes towards drinking, and I'm wondering about how this plays out in other countries, including, I'm thinking about France, Australia, um, and what are their rates of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, what are their rates of drinking um, during pregnancy, et cetera. So it's more of us looking sort of a cross-cultural 
approach there? So the first question relates to cannabis use in the antepartum. So it's going up and up and up. And so what we are having now is like a normalization of the use because it is a natural product. But, you know, for a long time it's been very difficult to figure out the impact of prenatal alcohol, um, marijuana use because um, women who were who in the studies also used other substances. But there are a number of newer studies that show that it actually has a harmful effect on brain development and it's not benign. Now what's bad is that people think it's like, it's a natural product. Well, you know, alcohol's a natural product too. And so it's a problem. Um, I think we're gonna learn a lot more and I think people want to believe that it works, but it actually doesn't like for nausea, et cetera. So the cross-cultural comparison. So people always bring up the quote French conundrum. But um, so there is increased recognition um, that fetal alcohol syndrome, fetal alcohol effects is a serious, serious, serious problem in the heavy drinking um, countries. So that in fact, there were many European countries that in advance of the United States put uh, warning labels on bottles. Um, the exact French translation escapes me at this point, and I do apologize, but it says something like no bouvet, no bebe, or something like that, so that there is increased appreciation. There, you know, the, the, there are incredibly high rates of cirrhosis in France, and so people do understand that as well. Um, and that there have been a number of attempts in other countries to modify drinking. So um, I would say that the Nordic countries like Sweden, et cetera, have made a real effort to um, intervene on prenatal alcohol exposure. And, you know, just based on the number of visits, you know, I've had to Uppsala and to the, um, the Karolinska, like there has been a really great effort to make modifications. So, um, but I think what you point out is it's complicated psychosocial problem. Um, there was a woman in the United States, an economist, who on her own decided to collapse all whatever data she could have, and she wrote this book called Expecting Better. And she concluded that we are infringing on women's rights during pregnancy, and that the, the data are not so um, compelling, and that people should be allowed to do what they want to do. Thanks so much for such a great talk. Um, this was excellent, and I have like a million different thoughts about what you're, <laughs> what you've just discussed because it's so important. Um, I think a couple of different things, maybe for points of discussion. First of all, the ABCD study, which you, um, which you mentioned, just to Roger's point, there's a recent uh, publication that shows that, um, in fact, it, it demonstrates that cannabis has um, effects in middle childhood exposure. And it happens at six weeks, which is when the endocannabinoid receptors come online in fetal development. So cannabis exposure at six weeks going forward um, is associated, according to the ABCD study, with um, middle child effects. Um, some of the same similar kinds of things that they found with alcohol. And to Grace's point, there have been a lot of women who actually think that because they have nausea in pregnancy and cannabis can sometimes counter nausea, that that's a safe and healthy way to manage your you know, nausea during pregnancy. And that's still out there right now. Um, so it's just, just one thing that's very worrisome, um, especially because there's this commingling of use. But I think you, know, um, you, you, you showed two different kinds of interventions in a way. It's people who are already drinking and they have known. So there's one set of interventions for those folks. But the other one, which is just from a population basis extremely important, is that we have lots and lots of you know, women of reproductive health age who, who who just, no physician ever talks to them ever about their drink, no physician ever talks to them about what they're doing with alcohol and, um, and cannabis. If you talk to people, did your doctor ask you about this? And you know, nine out of 10 times they say no. So I just wondered if you had thoughts about like how we 
help? You know, because I think um, healthcare providers have been shown to share most of the same stigma, again, you know, about all of these things as, you know, as do the general population through lack of education and their training. And I just wonder, how do we, what do we do? Because it seems like we have a, a, a big opportunity from a population health standpoint to like have, you know, physicians be more attuned to talk to people about these real risks that, you know, they have since 50% of pregnancies are unintended in the United States. Just so I was curious what your thoughts were. Well, thank you for that question. I mean, I do think that people don't end up worrying about the right things during pregnancy. So having, you know, met like hundreds of pregnant women, you know, in various studies, you know, very worried about having too much caffeine or using nail polish or something like that, which, you know, on the scale of things, not to make light of their concerns, but to educate, right? One major problem is that you know, people still don't agree that there is no safe drinking limit. And so I think that's a major problem. And again, it's seen as a moral failing. So just as we promote prenatal vitamins, we should promote no drinking. I mean, I think it's really at that level, um, without judgment, without stigma, without all of that. Now, I think the Project Choices is an example of you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So to prevent alcohol-exposed pregnancies. But what we don't know is if that knowledge is enduring. So the way around it is to screen people routinely. Um, and again, without judgment. And one of the most marvelous things is that it seems like assessment is so powerful. You know, I think people are smart. I think they can understand why you're asking. And I think assessment is a powerful tool. So, I'm going to follow up on Dr. Coyle's um, at least scientific assertion because I can see it being a really effective marketing campaign if it's true. Is it true that alcohol has been proven more toxic to a fetus than cocaine and heroin? Absolutely. I think that should be the marketing campaign to pregnant women. Did you know, did you know that alcohol is more toxic to your baby than cocaine or heroin, we recommend abstaining from all of them. Well, it's a powerful message, but it can also induce guilt and worries and all, so it has to be handled with some sensitivity. I'm not saying you're not sensitive, but I've had people come to me and say, I have to confess I had three glasses of iced tea, right? Right, not Long Island tea, but iced tea. So they were worried about the caffeine. So, so part of the problem is, you know, not having people feel bad. The other thing is that there is no exact dose response relationship between alcohol exposure and the antepartum and outcome. And that's where the genetics, the psychosocial, all come into play. So you don't want all these people then being worried asking for therapeutic abortions, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a complicated problem. No, that, that is so true. Alcohol is the only known teratogen. I, I just before we close, I would just also say, Chris, we also, it's very tough what you're saying because we live in a, 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 a culture that stigmatizes people who use substances, all people. And then the most stigmatized are pregnant women who use substances or mothers of kids. And in that climate, it's hard to figure out the best way to get a public health message out that's going to be most effective. And with that, I'm being told that we should give another round of applause because um, we're at the time. And this was fantastic. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk in honor of Kathy Cook, Dr. Chang. Thank you for having me.